food out of the freezer, she saw things were shutting down, and they were shoving the food through the mailbag. And so you come down to eat breakfast, and they say, pick out something, and we're going to get it. Okay? There was no water. You had to drink either beer or wine. You know. But, uh, you know, it was like, I'll have that steak. What's that? Yeah, just let it sit in your room for a minute. Exactly, and just relax, snuggle up in that Maybe bed. Maybe I'll save this story to my story next year. <laughs> I, I mean, it was the worst three days of my life. Uh, Super experience. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was. Super Bowl. Well, <laughs> after three days, you know, the hotel people don't want to see me. They're not nice anymore, okay? And I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be sure and lift up our volunteers this week. Okay. Good morning. morning. Grace and peace to all of you who are joining with us in worship this morning in person or online. My name is Reverend Melanie Marshbaum and I am one of the pastors here at Community Presbyterian Church. I say one of because we affirm in our tradition that we are a priesthood of all believers. And so I am just one of many ministers here at Community Presbyterian. And no matter how many of us there may be, it is my joy to welcome you to worship this morning. If this is your very first day, if you are worshiping online with us for the first time, or if you have been here your entire life long, today's worship is different and special because you are with us. And it is a joy to gather with you in the presence of God. This week, we are continuing our sermon series on courage. We began three weeks ago with the courage to be vulnerable. Last week, it was the courage to offer grace. And this week, we explore the courage to be last as we listen to the gospel writer Mark and we hear a message from our guest preacher, Reverend Donna Bowen. We're excited that next week, Reverend Donna and Melissa, our DCE, and I will also be co-leading our women's retreat at Camp Montgomery. And so we are excited to be able to have her leadership again for that. And we're also excited for those of you who won't be at the women's retreat because you will have the leadership of Robert and Thomas in worship on Sunday. And with all of these things in our hearts and our minds, in gratitude to God, 
Let us open our worship in prayer. God of all time and space, God of our fears and of our courage, be with us in this hour. Remind us of your presence in this place. As we hear your word proclaimed, may it stir our spirits. May it grow our courage to love and be loved by you. Amen. Throughout our journey of life, we have to find the courage to forgive. Not only forgive one another, but forgive ourselves. And sometimes that courage is just to take the simple first step of admitting before God and our community when we have done wrong. And so we gather at the beginning of our worship to confess before God and one another our brokenness, and our shortcomings. Let us pray. O oh God, in this moment of worship, we call to mind those times of failure and regret common to all of us. We remember first in silence those times when we have failed to do all that we meant to do, or through our actions, we failed to be all that you have called us to be. Oh God, we recall the moments and give thanks when you have enabled us to live into our integrity. Those times when we have lived into our deepest values and ask, acted as the human beings that we always dreamed we could be. Loving and merciful God, we choose at this moment to lay down the burdens of our shortcomings, to grasp the courage to begin anew. Together, as your people, we affirm our capacity for goodness and grace, for freedom and purpose and joy. We are not trapped by our past, but freed by creation to live and grow today anew. In deep gratitude and with humility, we say, thanks be to you, O God. Amen. With deep gratitude to God and in recognition of our redemption through the grace of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we are new people. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another either if you are online by offering a comment or an emoji in the screen, or if you are in person, you may stand and greet one another with any sign of Christ's peace that you wish. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please be seated. In our time for, uh, for all ages this morning, I want to share a story with you as we talk about courage and um, as we continue to talk about courage. So I was in New York City years ago on a business trip, and um, they called us in the sales meeting, and they said that um, uh, snowstorm's coming in. They're getting ready to shut down the airports. Get your gear. Go back to the hotel. Get your gear and get out of here. And... Um, so this was the perfect storm, the year of the perfect storm. Everybody saw the movie, or if you haven't. Um, so we, there we were. I was, I was with a sales rep traveling from, from Florida. And um, we get our, get our suitcases, and we get out to the airport. And by the time we get to the airport, it is snowing heavy. 
and the airport is shut down. No flights are leaving at all. And so I ran over to a round booth of phones. They used to have those in airports. And I picked up the phone and I called Amtrak, the train station. And they said they have two tickets left. I mean, everybody was on the phone trying to get out of there as soon as they can. There were no cars. You couldn't rent cars. You couldn't get out of there. So um, I would have had to get over to, to I think it's Penn Station. It's leaving out of Anyway, so we, as I'm hanging up the phone, I wrote down the confirmation number for my train tickets. As I'm hanging up the phone, there was a sailor who was on the phone right here trying to get back to Annapolis. And he was on, in a conversation with this commanding officer, and he said, sir, there's no way that we're going to get back there by Monday. Um, the, the airport's closed down, and you can't get a car, you can't get out of here, no buses are running, no transportation. And um, so this went on, this went on, and he hangs the phone up, he turns to his friend, and he said, we're not leaving, and they're going to mark us AWOL, missing in action, or AWOL. And I'm standing there in the airport, two tickets, last two tickets, and he needs to get back or his career in the, in the Navy is going to be marked. And um, so I turned to him and I said, take my two tickets. Here's the name they're under. Here's the confirmation number. You and your friend get back to Annapolis. Your career is much more important than my career at this point. Um, I, I can eventually get back. So he grabbed those and he left. Never heard from him again. Never, or in, don't know what happened, okay, but I gave up my tickets to these two young men to get back to Annapolis. And um, they, it takes sometimes when, and I want to say this, I, I thought about this story because I get the opportunity to walk out of my office and watch all the kiddos from Atlantic Beach Elementary play on the playground. I see them helping out each other. I see them encouraging each other. I see them putting others first. I also see them not doing those things at times, okay? But I get the opportunity to, to see it. And sometimes it takes courage to put others first. Sometimes it's not the giving and the receiving that we think that makes us feel good. It's when we give something back and we help others. And sometimes it takes courage to say, it's not about me, it's about them. Let us pray. Gracious God, it does take courage sometimes to put our selfish needs, our selfishness to the side to try to help somebody else out, to try to make their day a little better, to make them happy, to make them smile. So give us the courage each day to live as your children. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. And now to change the subject a little bit, next week is Super Bowl Sunday, of course, and we always do the Super Bowl of Caring. It's one of the missions that we do around here. Now we know that worship's a little bit different so I'm going to try to find a way for us to meet the goal that we have, that we, all, we, we always collect somewhere. Well, I need to back up for a moment. Go ahead and share that. All right. So someone, when I announced this in this morning service, someone after the service came up and said, I'll match dollar for dollar for, every, for, all, the, for all the monies that's collected for Super Bowl of Caring. Okay? So our goal next Sunday, I guess, would be 1000 bucks because I could get 2000 then. Um, but to try to meet our at least our minimum goal, we've always collected somewhere between three hundred fifty and three hundred seventy-five dollars in the Super Bowl of Caring. And here's the cool thing about it, and I'll tell you more about it next week. But all the money stays right here, and we decide where we want to put as a church to support the missions to help feed people in our community. So enough of that. Here's what I was thinking. Imagine this. The Jacksonville Jaguars are reloading right now, getting ready for our Super Bowl run next year. Okay. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if we had the youngest quarterback playing the oldest quarterback and coming out a winner? Yes. I'm not a Tom Brady fan. Okay, so you could – all right. So, anyway, I was about that this morning. I said, that would be kind of cool, you know, to end his career by the youngest quarterback to ever play in the Super Bowl. Let us pray. Gracious God, we take all that we have, all that we are, and we bring it to you. We turn ourselves over to you, all of our resources, and we ask that you continue to use those for the, for the spreading of your gospel and the sharing of your love, for the, uh, for the support that our church members do, for all the missions in this church and in the community around us. I give you thanks for that. 
And gracious God, I ask that, could, that you continue to lead us and guide us to do your work here in, at the beaches. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Our first scripture reading comes from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All of his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding, and his praises endure forever. The first reading. Good morning. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. Verses 21 through 28. Jesus and his four disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. The four disciples and those in the synagogue were astounded at his teaching, for Jesus taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and the man cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. All that were gathered were amazed and they kept asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? Jesus commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of our Lord, thanks be to God. I was um, happy that when I was asked to preach this morning that our reading was going to be from the Gospel of Mark. I have to say that Mark is one of my favorite Gospels because it is 
the shortest. It was the earliest. It was probably written about 40 years after Pentecost. And Mark is a writer of an economy of words. Every single word that he put in his gospel has import. It is significant because his gospel is so condensed, so short, sometimes almost abrupt. But, but Mark has an urgency of what he is trying to say. He's not the poet of Luke. Or the, I'm sorry, he's not the storyteller of Luke. Luke with his wonderful stories. He's not the mystic poet of John. He is simply, clearly, cleanly telling the story of who Jesus Christ is. As a matter of fact, in his first chapter, in the very first verse, he tells you the focus, the purpose of his gospel, of his good news. He begins with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's it. That's the central teaching. That's what he wants you to walk away with. That's what he wants you to hold deeply in your heart. Jesus Christ the Son of God. In his gospel, Mark talks about who Jesus the Christ is, what God is doing for God's people through Jesus Christ, and why. Why is God choosing to redeem and restore God's people through Christ? And there, in all of these layers, in all of, this, of the economy of words, we are to be looking for a fullness of meaning in who Jesus Christ is. In Mark's gospel, in just the first 20 verses, the first 20 sentences, Mark sets up everything that is to follow. In 20 verses, he it begins with us meeting John the Baptist. There's no birth story. We have no clue who Jesus' parents might be. No Mary, no Joseph. No angels, no shepherds, no wise men. None of that. No stories of what he may or may have not have done when he was a small boy. Nothing. The first beginning of Mark's gospel is with the introduction of John the Baptist, who is at the Jordan River. He is baptizing people to repent and to turn away from God. He is letting people know that someone will soon arrive on the scene and he's not worthy to tie the sandals. That no, this comes out of John the Baptist's mouth, and there is Jesus. You know, in the first few verses, there is Jesus, grown Jesus, and he comes to the river, and he's baptized by John, and the heavens open up, a dove comes down, and we hear the words, this is my son, my beloved. In Mark's gospel, he Jesus is off with the spirits into the wilderness. He spends 40 days discerning who he is and what his ministry and why he is here on earth. And at the end of those 40 days, he is sent out of the wilderness to the Sea of Galilee, where immediately, you hear the urgency, immediately he calls four disciples. Four men who have successful businesses, have employees, have homes, have family, have a place to live, have a, a sense of where they belong, these four grown men. Jesus, fresh off coming out of the wilderness, walks up to them. And there's something in the way he looks at them. There's something in his eyes. There's something in the way that a sense of the divine enfolds them. There is something so powerful in simply standing in the presence of Jesus that when he says, follow me, they do. They leave everything and they follow Jesus. 
So Jesus and these four men along the Sea of Galilee are going to Capernaum. Now, in the English, it might say they walked to Capernaum, they went to Capernaum, but in the Greek, it's a sense of urgency again. It's a sense of a holy quest. They are journeying. They are going there as quickly as possible. They are in a big hurry to get to Capernaum. And they get to Capernaum. Again, we're still in the very few, few first few verses. They get to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath, they go to the synagogue. They go to worship. They go to worship God. They walk into the synagogue, and Jesus, unknown to anyone, Jesus walks to the front of the synagogue, sees the teaching stool sitting at the front of the synagogue, and he sits down to teach. Let's think about it a second. I mean, I was invited. I'm, you know, I was invited. But can you imagine if we opened the door and someone walked off the street and walked up and sat down here in the front and said, I'm teaching today. You know, it would be a surprise. It would be shocking. It would be unusual. We would think, what is going on here? But Jesus does with authority. He walks up, he sits down, and he begins to teach. And Mark says, he taught not as a scribe. If we were one of Mark's listeners, we would know what that meant. We would know the profoundness behind those few words. A scribe is someone who had gone to school, who had studied with a mentor, who knew the scriptures, and they would come on Sunday and they would read a passage of Torah, the Mosaic Law, and they would say, my dear friends, we do this because... Moses has said this. My dear friends, we live this way because we read in Isaiah, this is how we should live. My dear friends, we choose not to do this because as we read in the story of David, we know that this is not something that pleases God. The scribe always referred back to scripture. The scribe never says, I think this is a good idea or this is what I believe, it was always, this is what Moses says. This is what Isaiah says. This is what David says. We learn to live and make choices by what these great persons of our faith have told us. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus boldly walks up, sits down at the stool, opens the scripture and says, I say, I say that the kingdom has come near. I say that we are called to love God and each other. I say we need to look out for the poor and the widows in our community. I say that we need to pay particular generous hospitality to the strangers in our midst. Do you hear the difference? Paul, John, Jesus is speaking with the authority of God. Jesus is speaking as if he is God. Jesus is speaking with a divine voice. And Mark lets us know that difference right away. So Jesus is in the synagogue. He has already shocked the bejeevers out of everybody by saying, he is God and you are listening to God this morning. And in their, stu I'm thinking stunned, listening, a man appears in the congregation, right there in the middle of the congregation. Now, this was a man who lived outside Capernaum. He lived outside the village. He lived outside the community. And he had been courageous enough to walk into the village, which was bad, and then to walk into the synagogue, this unclean man with this unclean spirit, he risked being stoned to death. He risked being stoned to death to come in here and to confront 
to ask, to plead, to question Jesus. And the man with the unclean spirit says, not the man himself, I need to be clear, it's not the man himself. His identity had been totally consumed by these unclean spirits. The, the person that he was created to be really was not existing anymore. It was only these spirits that had taken over his personality and his identity. These unclean spirits say to Jesus, I know who you are. Have you come to destroy us? And I think they were kind of smirking because I think they had so much power they thought Jesus couldn't do anything. So I know who you are. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And in that era, if you knew someone's name, if you could call someone by name, that meant you had power over them. That meant that you were in control of them because you knew their name. So these unclean spirits, they figured, I know who he is, and I am so powerful, I am still in control. And then Mark, letting us know who Jesus the Christ is, Jesus stands up, and he doesn't have to shout. He doesn't have to use a big booming voice. All he has to quietly say is, get out. Just get out. And then Mark tells us that there was a convulsing and, and all kinds of things happening, but the unclean spirits leave. Mark tells us right at the beginning who Jesus the Christ is. Jesus is one who has power over anything. The, that which is not of God no longer has power. It's powerless. It's gone. Those unclean spirits are gone. And the man remains there in the congregation. His true self, his true identity as a beloved child of God, as someone who is lovable, who is now who is someone who can come back to the family, come back to the community, come back to the village. Jesus has restored the life of that man. And he has restored his life for the community. He is now part of that family. So what is Mark trying to say? I mean, what is he was he trying to say to the listeners? What was he trying to say for the first persons who heard his gospel? What is he trying to say for us? First of all, I think it's interesting that Mark uses a plural. He doesn't say that there was one unclean spirit. He said that there was a group of unclean spirits. And I think he does that because he, this man represents each and every one of us. Each and every one of us have something that separates us from God. Maybe for a lifetime, maybe for a short crisis situation, maybe just a season of our life. But there is something that separates us from God. And what Mark is saying is that we can have the courage to walk to God where God is present, where God's space is, where God's power is, and we can let that go. We can let that which separates us from God go. It has no power. And we can be the persons that God has created us to be. I think every one of us, if we're honest, every one of us at some point in our life, at some time in our life, there has been something, shame or guilt or regret or loss, something that we feel has put a, a wall between us and God. And it's that thing that when we wake up in the morning, it's on our mind, whether we want to think about it or not. It's that something that is in the back of who we are all day long, just waiting to push through and remind us of our guilt or our addiction or regret or loss. And when we go to bed at night and we just really want a good night's sleep, it's what keeps us 
restless in the night. And what Mark is saying is that since God has come and God has declared that the kingdom has drawn near and that we are kingdom people, we do not need to live with that barrier, that wall. We can be courageous and come forward and say, God, please help me. This, I do not want this to have power over my life. This cannot be my identity one more day. I want to have my true identity. I want to be truly who I am. I want to be someone who is loved by God and loved by others and called to make a difference in the world. Can you imagine Mark finishes all of that in like 28 verses? I mean, in a paragraph, he covers all of that. How can you not love Mark? You know, that, that economy of words, that clarity, that carefulness in choosing words, and how he can help us to come to love Christ fully. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, as we hear the words of Mark, which are in truth your words spoken to us, may we have the courage to recognize what is not our true identity, which is not who we truly are, May we have the courage in our prayers in this moment, in this place, or at another time, shouting on the beach or in the trees. May we tell you what it is that separates us. You know already. Let us be honest with each other. And Lord, I know that it has no power over our lives, that you are the one who can ask us, Ask it, ask that barrier to just get out so that we may truly be your people, that we may love more abundantly, we may be more generous, we might be more helpful, we might truly be your people in our broken world. Amen. As we turn our hearts to prayers and lifting up the needs of our community and those around us, uh, we wanted to, uh, let me kind of give you an update. And, um, but before I give you the update, we wanted to re remind everyone that if you know of someone or maybe yourself that you'd like to, for us to, to reach, to uh, call you, email you, say a prayer with you, Zoom, have a little Zoom meeting with you, whatever it is, before a surgery, after a surgery, we just, you just need to say, I, I just could use a little prayer in my life, call the office. Let us know. We'll be happy to return you. We'd love to call you back and spend some time with you in ever, whichever, however way we can. So I uh, just wanted to put that out there. And then also we, let's remember uh, the families of John or Jack. He passed away earlier in the week. For uh, Let's remember Susan and her sister Deborah in the passing of the, the husband and brother Ray. 
for Valerie, who is facing surgery and cancer diagnosis, for Patrice and Jennifer, for Jean, who is 93 and fighting numerous medical challenges, for those who are caregivers, especially GBS, for Debbie V and their successful surgery, for Jan and Jerry who are in the hospital, Carolyn, who's fighting cancer, for Becky and the loss of her mother, for Jackson, who is Jackson C, who is searching for a job, and for Rich and for Rosa. Let's remember Mariana Dun Duncan and the loss of her, her mother. For the family again of um, or for, for the family again of Ray, who he passed away, and his just remember his wife and his children. And then Sabrina, uh, who is facing some uh, some eye problems. And you can pick up if you'd like to know more about the ones that we're lifting up. You can pick up a list in the back of the church, or you can email Melissa, and she'll be happy to send it to you. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we come into your presence today, and we know that you are the source of healing, the source of peace and strength. You're the one whom we get courage from, wisdom. And we know in your love that we find mercy, kindness, and assurance. We find restoration and life. So, oh God, we lift up those we've called out this morning and all those who are facing medical challenges and cancer. Give them the strength that they need, O oh God. Guide the doctor's hands, the medical treatment, help them find the medical treatment as they fight these battles. For those who are having surgery or are recovering from surgery, we lift them up to you as well. We pray for a speedy recovery and a complete recovery. For those who are struggling or in need of peace, Gracious God, you are the source of our peace. Help them find the peace and ease the anxiety. Remind them, O oh God, that these things that, they, that are keeping them from having the peace in their life are powerless against them. They are your children. We are all your children. We all need a touch of your love in our life and the assurance that peace and that power is in our hands. Again, O oh God, there are many that are on our heart. And so as we stand here in your presence this morning to find help in time of need, we silently hold those that are on our heart before you. And now, O oh God, I lead your people in the prayer that Jesus taught his people to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved children of God, as we go back out into the waiting world today, as we go back out into a world in need of God's love and God's grace, may we go with courage in our hearts. Courage to love as God loves. Courage to forgive not only others, but ourselves. And as we go, May we know this day and forevermore the immeasurable love of God surrounding us, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ keeping us and filling us, and the connection of the Holy Spirit holding us and binding us together with those in this room, with those outside, and with all God's people everywhere. Amen. Amen.